Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hey, I'm Maggie. I'm a great for recovering alcoholic. Thank you so much for asking me to speak. Um, so just, uh, let's just get this out of the way. Um, we live really far away from here. Okay. So, um, does anybody watch the walking dead? Okay. So we live in, I live in the town that that's filmed in. And, um, so that's over like it's far. And, um, (laughs) so when I came in and started to actually, start doing the steps and stuff, my sponsor, you know, because I still lived in Sonoy. And my um, my sponsor, you know, she would say, well, she her home group was Clarkston over here on the other side of Decatur, over there in Decatur world. And she would say, well, we're going to go and go here. I'm like, God, that's so far from my house. And she's like, well, Maggie, would you go there for free beer? And I'm like, I think I would. And she's like, okay, we'll see you at eight o'clock. So, um, everything I did in early recovery was on the scale of free beer. So I definitely would have come here for free beer back in the day, just to let you know, I wouldn't have even given it a second thought. And even though I didn't know anyone in the back row, I know they all would have been here with me too. So I'm just, you know, just go on from there. So, okay. So let me just get started. Um, my sobriety date is December 29th, 1995. So that puts it, um, a little over 21 and a half years and it's right in between Christmas and New Year's. So that right there goes to show the, where my mind was that I wound up in AA in between Christmas and New Year's. And I was actually in my therapist office uh, because everybody was going to therapy. So, you know, my life sucks. So why would I not be in therapy? So I was in therapy on a Monday morning, on a Saturday morning. And she said, why just, why don't you just go to AA? And I said, all right. And the next thing you know, I'm sitting at the Triangle Club like 45 minutes later. So um, she was right around the block. I think she had the whole thing planned. But anyway, I wound it up on December 29th in, at the Triangle Club. And I know nothing. I remember nothing of that meeting. All I remember of that meeting is that it was really, really big. Have you ever been to the Triangle Club? Do you know where it is? It's right by a package store. Yeah, so that's how we found it. So, um, <clears throat> but it's a big room with, and it was all painted yellow, and it had really big windows, and it had white plastic chairs. That's what I remember. So, um, I did go to that meeting, and I did promise my therapist that I would go 30 days and try not to drink. And the minute I agreed that I would try not to drink, she would say, and go to AA. I was like, God, you know, you know, so much. I, so I promised that I would go to AA. And then she's like 90 meetings in 90 days. I was like, God, you're never, ever happy. So I promised <laughs> that I would go to AA. Um, and I would not drink for 30 days. And, um, in those 30 days, because what my, what my knowledge of AA was, was I knew everyone in my family should be going there. And I know that you can't drink when you go to AA. And I knew the serenity prayer. That was the only things that I know of AA. So I just know it was the end of my life having to go to AA. So that's where I wound up on the day in in between Christmas and New Year's on the 29th of December. So, but I will tell you that, um, I do have a sponsor. She's with us tonight and I, um, I am, she has a sponsor. Um, she and they are all routed in the steps and the traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous and the steps and the, and the steps and the traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous 
have given me the life that I have today, and I am, I could not have imagined what it would be like today, way back then. So, but um, my home group is Turn Lost and Found. It is all the way down in South Georgia. Um, but um, it's, well, you know, I mean, look where we are. I mean, we're like north of Atlanta. So, but um, <clears throat> I got sober at Clarkston. And when, um, when I came in, well, actually, let me, I'd like to get this out of the way. So, um, 87, 86 days ago, my sister passed away and it's been a very emotional, emotional 86 days. So I want to get that out of the way, um, because I really think it sucks. And as much as I think it sucks, if this would have been 21 years ago, I would be not that I, I'd be at the bar with you telling you how my life is not fair, how I got a raw deal, how life sucks. But with recovery and the steps and the years, I can tell you that I was not personally attacked because my sister passed away. I can tell you that my sister was loved. I can tell you that I enjoyed her. I was lucky to have her. I can also tell you, I don't feel like God was against me or is out to get me. And that would never have come about if I did not work the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. So I'm not happy about it, but I can't change it. So anyway, I wanted to get that out of the way so we can start talking about some, some of the good stuff. Um, so anyway, I did come into AA. I was 33 years old. They asked me to go 30, 30, 30 days. Yes, 30 days. Um, so I went to the Clarkston. Nope, I went to the Trent Club. So I didn't realize what you had to do in early sobriety. So I didn't talk to anybody at the meeting. Um, so it was probably about another week or so. I went back to Clarkston. I went back to the Trent Club. And when I went the first day... There was, um, the parking lot was full of people. Um, there were people on the stairs smoking. There were people in the lobby making coffee. Everybody had a cup and the place was just packed. Well, when I came the next time on my second meeting, it was um, a 1.30 meeting on like a Monday or a Tuesday. And I drove up and there was not one person there. And so I'm a big person with signs from God. And this was a sign from God. <laughs> so I drove up and I said, well, there's nobody here. Obviously, I meant to go get some beer. So I was like, well, I'll make a deal with you, God. I'll go up to the building and if the doors are open, I'll go in. But if not, I'll go get some beer. And I think this is a great plan. So I go up, I park the car, I go up, I go upstairs and I'm pulling the door and the freaking door opened. So I walked in, and um, there's nobody in the lobby. Nobody's making coffee, and I'm like, crap. So I was like, well, I'll make a deal with you, God. I'll go in the door. I'll open up these doors, and if there's anybody in there, I'll go in. If not, I will, um, I'll go get some beer. So I think this is a great plan. I'm very proud of myself with the plan. So I go pull on the door. I open it up. The room is really big and it's really bright and it's all the white chairs and the yellow and, and, um, I don't see a freaking soul. And right as the doors start to close, there's like a little bit of color over in the corner and it just caught my eye and I was like, crap. And I, I grew up Catholic and I grew up cutting church. And this is what we would do when we were cutting church. We would send somebody in to see who was telling, who was saying the mass so we could report it at the house. And so that's exactly how I felt. I was going up, looking to see who the priest was, but now there's someone in the corner and now I feel, I feel court. So I look in and it's this guy and he says, are you here for an AA meeting? And I'm like, well, you know, what do you, I'm like, I got nothing. So he's like, come on, come on, sit down. So I come in and I sit down and it's this man and me. And he says, well, you only need 
two people to have an AA meeting. And I'm like, so I was like, and he says, I'll start. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I, I can certainly see that. So he says, you know, today I have, I haven't had a drink in 30 days. 30 days ago, my wife wanted a divorce. I was homeless. I was living under the bridge over here at Piedmont and I didn't have a job. But today, um, in a homeless shelter, I'm in a shelter. I have a part-time job doing dishes, and my wife is willing to go to counseling with me. And I was thinking, God, all in 30 days? I'm not even going to need to be here for 30 days. I could probably be done in three weeks. So so he starts talking, and then I think I said something really wise, and then um, all of a sudden these other people show up, and... So they all shared, and right as I was leaving, these women, they said, do you want to come with us to a women's meeting? And I'm like, there's other meetings, because this is the, you know, who knew there were just a mecca amount of meetings. So we wound up going to another meeting, and that meeting was at Clarkston. And that's where I spent my third meeting. Um, uh, Right before that meeting, um, I wound up at the gas station getting gas. Um, The person at the at the counter, shortchanged me, and I know that she shortchanged me, and I freaked out because she was not giving me back my money. The girl who I was taken to the meeting was out in my car, so all she could see was me inside the gas station, winging my arms around, screaming and yelling, and all of a sudden she comes running in, and she's like, just come on, we'll go to the meeting. I'm like, I am not leaving here without my money. You know, I mean, it was probably like $10, but, you know, $10, $10 when you don't have any money. So um, so she drags me out of there and drags me to an AA meeting. And I'm like, great. So we go to this meeting. It's an all-women's meeting, and they break up into little circles, into little rooms, and off they go. So they send me off into this room, and I'm sitting there, and all these women, they're going around, and they're all sharing which year is their toughest in sobriety. And I am just pissed. I am so freaking pissed. And they're all talking about what is so rough and they're, you know, what year was so bad. And <clears throat> so I said, you went, so there was a lull in the conversation. And I said, you know, you women, you just piss me off. I can't, I can't tell you, you're talking about your third year's your toughest. I'm freaking shaking off this chair. And then, you know, I'm going on and on. And so I got done thinking I'm going to have to you know, fight my way out of the room. But, um, so I got done sharing and this woman shares next and she says, we're so glad you're here. And I'm like, what? So, you know, so then, you know, the rest of the meeting goes off and right as we start to break up, this little old lady comes walking over to me and she, you know, she's beeline to me and I'm like, Oh, here she comes. This is the one she must be in charge. And so she comes over and she's like, you. And I'm like, oh, here it comes. She's like, you. You keep coming back. I'm like, all right. Okay, I can do that. So she's like, yeah. And so she's like, and you need to get a sponsor. I thought, oh, my God. So so that started the whole revolving doors of the world with the sponsors. But, you know, <laughs> I went into, so, but I started going to Clarkston and I started to meet some people and I started to go to the meetings after the meeting and I started to enjoy it, you know? And of course I said to get a sponsor. So I got, I got a sponsor. And so and I got seven sponsors in my first year and it wasn't like I was trying to get seven sponsors, but what, you know, things just happen. And so, but <laughs> I will tell you, um, the week before my first birthday, um, my sponsor had fired me and she fired me because I could not, I could not hear her and she would talk to me, but I could not hear her. And I am one of those people in the meetings that sit there. And when people talk, I'm like, Oh, good. I can understand them. And then there are other people who talk, and I'm like, I have not a clue what they just said. And other people be in there, and they'll be shaking their heads, and I'll be like, I have no idea what that person's talking about. But, you know, that's just not my person. You know, I cannot, you know, that person is not on the same wavelength with me, you know? So, (coughs) so, 
Um, she and I were not on the same wavelength. So, um, but my seventh, my eighth spot saw her. She was on my, on my, I could understand when she talked to me. I was able to understand when she explained things. Excuse me. So, so when I could understand when she explained things. And it was, it was challenging because she had to tell me over and over and over again. I was not a quick learner. I didn't understand when she would say, do this. And I could not see the value of that. Then I didn't want to do it. I needed to see the payoff before I got, before I wanted to be willing to do that. And that's not kind of how it works. So, so, <coughs> sorry. So, um, the, so, um, the first year was kind of, you know, that way. And then the second year, if you really, if you really don't think your program is really uh, stepping it up, you need to do, you need to start dating. That really like steps it up. So, um, you know, all they do all the first year, all they said was, Got to do a fourth step. Got to do a fourth step. That's all they told me. Got to do a fourth and fifth. Got to do a fourth and fifth. And you can't date in your first year because I was single. Can't date in your first year. Can't date in your first year. Fourth and fifth step. Fourth, you know. So after my first year, I got my fourth and fifth step done. You know. So now I'm going to start dating. And of course, in comes this um, this amazing woman, and I'm like, oh my god, this program is just amazing, you know. So so she comes in and. Um, <laughs> This is what I've learned about people in AA. Not everybody is healthy. <laughs> not, <clears throat> not everybody is honest. And um, they will take you down if you let them. And that's exactly what almost happened. And between January and July, my life took such a bad turn that I wound up thinking, <clears throat> my life sucked so bad a year and a half ago that I went to AA. My, love, my life sucks even more now, and I don't even get to drink beer. There is a problem here, you know. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I was going to leave my house in Sonoy one day and drive to Dunwoody, to commit homicide. So, <clears throat> cause I was so pissed. And then my friend Dorinda calls and she's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I tell her the plan. I'm going to take a shower. I'm going to go kill her. And then I'm going to go to jail. And then she's like, um, well, can you stop by the house? I have to show you something. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and, and my first thought was, you know, always thinking of others. And I'm like, oh, God, you know, I'm like, all right. You know, so I take a shower and I was going to buy beer because I figured if I'm going to go away, I could start all my time over. So what the hell? So I figured, but I didn't want to buy beer, taking it to Dorinda's house because she was like my AA person. So I was like, I'll get here later. So I get to Dorenda's. I don't even know what she wanted to tell me, but I basically like passed out on her couch. And, um, and then later that night I was on the phone with my sponsor and I'm trying to explain. And she's like, well, you're on this emotional hangover. And this is, you know, you're on this turmoil and all this stuff was in the literature, everything she was saying. But so what I learned in this relationship is that not everyone is healthy. If anybody wants to tell me a secret that I personally cannot tell my sponsor, then I do not need to know it. Because my life turned into, I can't talk to this person about this. I can't talk to this person about this. This is our bond. We are connected. You know, we have this, you know, it's just us. And, and it got really bad really quickly. And I almost lost my sobriety. And um, I was in the parking lot at Clarkston, and I said to um, 
Linda, you know, why is my life like this? And your life just seems like you go to work and go to meetings. And she's like, well, if you want what we have, you have to do what we do. And we go to meetings and we go to big book studies and step studies. We find God, clean house, and we service to others. And so next thing she said, the next thing you do, the next time anybody asks you to do anything, you are to say yes. And I'm like, but all, you know, she's like, no, you need to just say yes. And so the next meeting I went, and so I prayed. If you don't want your life to pray, change, you don't need to pray. But if you want it to change, so I said a quick prayer. And next thing you know, the next meeting I went to, I was in a, um, someone asked for a volunteer. They needed people to answer the phones at the central office. So I said, I could do that. So, <clears throat> and then I found out that it was for free. And then I said, Linda, they're not going to pay me. Um, and she's like, well, you need to do it for free. And I'm like, well, I need $2,000. I don't need to do it for free. She's just, just do it. So I did it and I did it for, I think six months. Every Friday, um, the shift started at nine o'clock and um, it went to 1130. And every Friday I got there at 915 because I'm helping them. So I show up and Helen, have you ever been to the central office? Helen, she would say, the shift starts at 9 a.m. So I'm thinking I'm really helping them. But um, this is where my alcohol and my thinking is just so distorted. Because what would happen in the first couple of hours on a Friday is that I spent not thinking of me for the first time in my entire life. And then at 11.30, I would be so freaked out. I would have to go to an AA meeting, but the rest of the day was good. And then my sponsor pointed out all these changes, how you feel on Friday morning and how you feel on Friday afternoon is just all inside work. None of that changed on the outside. You still $2,000 in debt and you still have this issue and that issue, but you still feel good. And so this is where all of that started to turn around. So um, I was willing to do whatever anyone asked. And in the last couple of, in the past 20 years, it's been an amazing, it's been an amazing journey. I've loved um, a majority of it. Um, there's been some times that I thought were a little tougher than others, but it still has worked out better than anything that I had ever experienced before here. You know, <clears throat> I had um, um, the, I had breast cancer. You talked me through the breast cancer. I went back to college. You talked me to, you talked me through calculus. I mean, you talked me through everything. Um, I would show up and I'd be a mess, and you'd be like, oh, "Just keep coming back, Maggie." And you know, and my life got better. Um, I mean, I got married, and and life is good. It has its moments. You know, my sister passing away wasn't a, a fun moment, <clears throat> but I was able to participate as a sober person in a family situation, and I wasn't drunk. And I, I, if I if I had to do that, that's how I want to be able to do it. So, and AA, the steps, and God, and you guys gave all that to me. So let me tell you what I did to earn the seat. So um, I am, I'm 54 years old. So I was born in 1962. Um, I have um, an older brother. I had an older sister, but I have an older brother. Mary Ellen was in between us. So my brother and I are 14 years apart and my sister and I are 10 years apart. So when I came around, they were much older. So it was like I grew up in a family of four parents. So um, my, um, my mom passed away when I was um, 15 months old. So my dad put us 
um, put me at my aunt's house, which was, you know, we lived in Brooklyn, we an Irish Catholic family, and <clears throat> um, so we lived in a neighborhood. Everyone knew her. Everyone went to school together. Everyone went to church together. We had family on this block and family on that block. So we were, you know, very close in the little neighborhood. I get to see my brother and sister and my dad on weekends. And so um, after um, I personally did not like living there, um, it sucked. It sucked for many reasons, you know, but um, one of the things that AA has given me is the way to look back and see how all that actually, I viewed it all differently than how it was. And so when I'm in my first year, when they were talking to me about doing a fourth and fifth step, and um, my questions were, you know, I have this huge resentment with God. How do you want me to go to God about this situation when it's about God? And they're like, well, why don't you pray? So I was like, so I prayed. And once again, um, the very next meeting was a woman who had a very similar background to mine. I mean, her mother died young, you know, and... How did she get through that and be okay with God? So um, after the meeting, we met, and she told me, she said, you know, one of the things that I learned is that not everything that happens in the world was at me. You know, when things happen, it didn't necessarily happen to me because I personally thought everything was happening to me. It certainly felt that way. And so... Ah, my mother dying was not a punishment from God. So I was like, really? Because I always thought it it certainly always felt that way. So, um, and then, of course, I had my aunt. And what I realized is that when I am 15 months old and start start a resentment list, my resentments didn't mature. So they still stayed at a very young age. And when I tried to actually verbalize them the first time, it, they didn't even make sense, but they still were there, if that makes sense. So <clears throat> so um, my sponsor said, why don't you try to look at it from your aunt's perspective? What it was like for your aunt? Because my aunt was my mother's sister. And of course, I have a sister. And then I looked at it, you know, my aunt and my mother were 10 years apart, and I and my sister are 10 years apart. And then all of a sudden, I um, I just had this thought, what would it be like if I lost my sister right now? And I remember thinking, oh, that is so sad. My aunt must have been so sad, you know, she now had five children. I was her fifth, you know, and she had all under eight. Right there is just crazy. But that must have been really hard. And that right there started to break down the walls of that resentment that I had that really didn't even make sense. So so that's what, that's what some of the steps have done is I've been able to review that and see that that was, I was able to look at it from a different view and to realize that I got to stay there. It was a gift. And the gift was that I got to see my dad every weekend because if not, I would have been out on Long Island and only been see, able to see him once a month. <clears throat> but it never, I never thought of it like that. But that's one of the steps what the steps have been able to do for me. So, so okay. So, where am I? I was off on a little tangent there. Sorry. So, anyway. My dad remarried when I was eight. Um, he married this great woman named Regina. We loved her. She was with us up till, like, four years ago. She was 96 when she passed. She was a trooper. She was a... Uh, she was a good woman. She loved me like I was her own. And, of course, um, 
my so it kind of made us like a family. <coughs> and then of course, um, Regina at that time worked for AT and T. We lived in Brooklyn. She worked in Manhattan. Um, she got tra- she got an offer to go to the faraway land of New Jersey. And my um, my brother and sister both got married and moved out. And so my father and Regina decided they would take this position, and we moved to the faraway land of New Jersey. And so that's what we did. We packed up and we moved to New Jersey. And what they do not have, you know, going from the city to New Jersey, it was like we were going to Mars. I mean, it was like, it was so, they didn't even have sidewalks. I mean, it was crazy. It was like, oh my God, you know. So, so I got to spend my high school years in New Jersey. And we did drink. Um, I come from a drinking family. Um, we didn't have a drinking cabinet. We had a drinking, you know, we had a liquor closet. You know, when my father would go to the liquor store, he wouldn't go and get like a case. He'd get like 25 cases of beer. Um, and we knew, I think, I think it's always funny when people would talk about going to different liquor stores so people wouldn't know them. Well, my family took pride in going to the liquor store and buying all this liquor. I mean, so when you walked into the liquor store, everybody knew you. I mean, so it was, we, you know, we took pride in that. So uh, my father, we had a refrigerator downstairs just for beer and um, nothing else. And then, um, you know, we drank as teenagers. And I wouldn't say that I was a good drinker. But, you know, I kept at it, and so um, <laughs> I'd get sick. I'd be sick. I'd be hungover for three days. The hangover beat me all the time. I hated the hangover. I hated people who didn't have hangovers. But the best way to do that is to drink again. So that, w- that came up very quickly. So I decided I was going to go to college. Um, I decided I was going to be a teacher. I'm not a good student. I have a tough time when people try to explain things. So I have, I have to take a lot of time when people explain things. So, um, so I figured if I can learn, I can explain it. So I was going to go away and be a teacher. So I, I went away to college and my freshman year and my, um, my dad got sick and I, they called me home right before, uh, Christmas. And I'm like, you know, I'm going to take finals, like, on Monday. And they're like, oh, don't worry about it. Just come on home. So so we go home, and we realize that my father is much sicker than um, I had ever realized. And um, so my father actually uh, passed away. And um, he passed away that Tuesday, like, nine days before Christmas. So um, it was very... Um, it was, it was very trying. It was, uh, it was very hard. And when the doctor asked Regina, how much did he drink? And she would say, she said, well, he would drink about 17 beers a day. And then he would switch to Bloody Marys. And then he'd switch to um, screwdrivers. And then we'd have dinner. And then he'd go to bed. And that was... That was like my whole life. He had drank like that my whole life. And like, who doesn't drink like that? And um, so um, my father was not a, um, a violent alcoholic. He wasn't, um, I, I don't even know if he was even drunk. You know what I mean? So he was always the same all the time. And um, when I um, came into AA, and I was around step nine. I had a um, I had a dream, and I was telling my friends everyone. I don't know when when I came into AA, everyone had friend dream friend interpreter dreamer and dreamer friends who can interpret dreams. Okay, so these are the kind of friends I had. So they could all interpret dreams. So <laughs> so I have this dream, and it, it's my father in it. And I look at this, um, and so my girlfriend says, well, what happened? So I was like, well, I'm in the dream, and he's in the mirror, and he's talking to me, 
but I can't hear. And she says, uh, well, that's because his voice is falling on deaf ears. I'm like, what the hell does that mean? You know, so I'm getting like all mad. And so she's like, well, you know, your father, he gave you a great gift. And I'm like, and what might that be? And, you know, because I'm 18, he died. I mean, my mother had died. I'm 18. So, and she's like, well, he gave you a great gift. And I, she, you know, and I was like, what? She's like, well, you know, your dad died of alcoholism, so you wouldn't have to. And I was like, oh. <laughs> and right then there, all those walls of, all those walls just started to break down. And to realize that I have a life today that he could never have imagined. And I feel really blessed with that. And I, um, I never would have got that if I didn't come in here. It's very cool. So, um, I continued to drink. I didn't graduate, but I did continue to drink. Um, my drinking took on um, a purpose, took on meaning. I took on, I drank at things. I drank all the time. Um, I, could, I drank as much as I possibly could. And so when everybody else was graduating, I decided um, I would do the next best thing, and I would uh, join the Marine Corps. So two weeks later, I was in Paris Island, um, and if you don't know anything about Paris Island, they're full of Marines and <clears throat> the Marine Corps and college are different ways of thought. So college really wants your opinion. They ask you, what is your opinion? Marine Corps, not so much. So, um, I, I got a lot of, um, extra attention because I really thought that they could really need, well, and honestly, they really could use some help. Okay. So anyway, so, um, I did really well in the Marine Corps. Um, you have to be able to do two things. You have to be able to be physically fit and I was already athletic, so I could do that. And then you have to be able to drink. And I certainly could do that. So I did. So I fit really well in the Marine um, or type environment. So the furthest place from New Jersey is um, Japan. So when they were asking for orders, where you'd like to go, I picked Japan. So a year and a half later, I'm on my way to Okinawa, Japan. Well, you know, now I'm 22. Um, I am now almost seven inches taller than the majority of the continent and, um, <laughs> I'm blue eyed and light hair and I'm a woman, uh, a woman American. So now my drinking has taken on more meaning. Now I'm drinking because I'm American. I'm drinking cause I'm American. <laughs> I'm drinking because I'm an American. And so we, um, I, I didn't think I could drink more, but I was surprised because I could drink a lot more than I thought. So, so we did a lot of drinking and, um, it was a good time. And one day we had, um, a friend of mine wanted to see, I was actually stationed on Okinawa and Okinawa is an island off the coast, south of the coast of Japan. And um, it's not very big. It's like the size of Hawaii. No, it is not. It has the same type weather as Hawaii, but it's only like 69 miles long. And it only has like one road. So we decided it was a beautiful day. We decided we'd get a, you know, a cooler beer, of course, and um, one of my girlfriends and I drive to the north end of the island and just see the island. 
Well, we get up there. There is this, uh, we had to go to the bathroom. Okay. This is how it all starts. So we, um, one of the bases, the base at the top end of the island is called Camp Something. Who knows? So anyway, we pull into Camp Something and there are no women at this camp because it's the break. So there's no women, no, no American women stationed at this camp. So we pull up and there's these two Lance Corporals and they're all happy. We're all happy. And so we want to use the head. So they give us directions to get into the base to go use the women's head. So they're like, go down four blocks, make the right, go down two blocks. We had to go all the way into the base. So we drive all the way in, go down four, turn two, you know, so we're all in. We go in and use the head. I go back to the car. And I'm sitting in the car, and then Blake, my buddy, she decides <clears throat> there the the path, the walkway, is lined with these bullets. Okay, so they're like three feet high, and they're white and red with a red tip, and and she thinks that we need one, so she goes to pick up this concrete bullet. And it's so heavy, so she has to drag it to the car. So now I think this is very funny. So I'm sitting in the car just laughing. Not, I, mean, I don't jump out and help her, but anyway. So I just think it's very funny. And so she decides that we should put it in the back seat. So she picks up the bullet, which was very funny. And then instead of opening the door, she had to slide it through the window. And so it, she, it, she was scraping up the car anyway. It fits perfectly in the back seat of the car. It's a sign from God. So, so we just think this is a great thing. So we uh, stop at the PX and we buy some more beer and she gets um, a bottle of red, green, and And so we take off and now we're leaving and we wind up hitting all the traffic from the beach that com- comes onto the main highway. So, Blake winds up passing out, and um, we're in this traffic, and so <clears throat> I wind up um, hitting the car in front of me, and um, I kind of like tapped up, okay, because we were in traffic, kind of like rolled, but still, they were really pissed, and so I look up, and there's all these Japanese people in the car, and they pop out like like a clown car. I swear. Okay. So like all these people like hop out and my experience on the island is that if they know any English, they tell you right away, you know, just like I use all my four Japanese lines right away too. So like good morning, good evening, taxi driver. Okay. So they don't know any English except MP. That's what they know. So, so they're like telling me they're going the MPs. And I was like, oh, what? So, anyway, I wake Blake up and um, I look in the back seat and there's all the beer, you know, all the cans of beer and everything, the bottles and everything. So, I wake up Blake and I talk to her like a Marine. I'm like, Marine, I have a mission for you. And her eyes get big and everything. And I was like, you know, you need to get rid of all the beer in the mix. So, so she goes and she takes all the beer and off she goes. And then she comes back and she's like, mission complete. And I'm, I, I totally have forgotten she was even with me. I was like, oh my God, you're here. So anyway, <laughs> so she comes, so the, uh, the Japanese police show up first. And so they're like taking all the information and, so I'm leaning on the hood of the car with Blake and Blake's next to me and the Japanese police call me over and I go to take a step and I trip over Blake's feet and I almost hit the foot. I almost hit the deck. And so right before I, you know, almost right before my face hits the deck, Blake grabs me and the two of us freeze. And she says, that was not a good move. And I'm like, I know. And we're hoping nobody said anything. And then all of a sudden, the Japanese policemen all start running around screaming like they were mad. And so um, I'm like, whatever. So they keep coming over to me with this balloon. They want me to blow into this little balloon. 
And I'm like, I am blown into blood. I am blown into you know, and I realize that they don't speak any English, so I tell them exactly what I think. Which of course I'm really not proud of because <clears throat> I was really it was um it was in my finest moment. It was um I hope I never have to live through that again, but I did tell them exactly what I thought and I was really it was it was really rude and obnoxious and arrogant. So if you ever do travel abroad and you hear that Americans are rude, obnoxious, think of me because I helped build that reputation. So um <clears throat> So the MPs show up, and it's the uh, Air Force MPs, and they say, um, you got two choices. And I'm like, you're damn right I got two choices. I'm an American. What are my choices? And he's like, well, you can blow in a little balloon here, or you can blow in it in Japanese jail because it doesn't matter because you're going to Japanese jail anyway. And I remember thinking... And that, and that basically, that, that, that just like took out all the wind out of my sails. I mean, I literally just sat on the curb and just started crying. Talking to God out loud, because that's how bad it was. That's how bad it was. I was like, God, take my stripe. You know, I don't care. Send me to American jail, you know. So, and Blake, of course, being the Marine, she's sitting with me, crying with me. And, um, so we're sitting there crying and, um, they asked me, so I blew in the balloon, and then um, <clears throat> I don't know what else happened next. And then all of a sudden, the MPs come over, and they said, the Japanese police decided they don't want you. And I was like, really? Really? You know? <laughs> and so like, I was like, really? And I'm like wiping my tears, and we're almost like hugging and dancing, you know? And so... Um, yeah, I was. They, yeah, they had just changed their mind, and so I was like, "Oh my God, that's just great!" So, like, all of a sudden, like, it was a totally different, uh, you know, totally different scenario. And um, then all of a sudden, the police were like, they were standing there talking, and they're like, "What? What's the problem now?" And they're like, "Well, they're deciding on how to get rid of your car." And I was like, "I'll drive my car." And they're like, "You need to sit down and shut up." And I was. Like, just trying to help there, you know, just trying to help their officer or so, whatever his name was. And so, you know, over the years, um, so anyway, they wound up impounding my car and I had to get transferred from base to base to base. And when the, our base came t- to finally pick us up, our staff, our staff sergeant on duty, he said, you know, when I got the call, that there were two drunk women Marines in trouble up here. How did I know one of them was you? And I was like, what steps? What, 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 what? what? I, I, I don't understand. And the thing that I have learned about that entire scenario is that not once did I think of anybody else through that entire thing. And for years, I would tell, like I've been telling that story now, God, it's been over 30 years. And I never realized the level of selfishness that it has, that I had just just that one day. And that was a threat through my entire life. And I have huge bouts of that now. I have, um, I, I struggle not seeing, being able to see what is good for me. I struggle, and I think, I think I know, and then I make decisions, and I wind up in the wrong spot. And this is why I need to continue to do, this is why I need to continue to come back here and continue to do what I'm supposed to do. Or else the behavior that I had that day didn't, won't seem like it was a problem. It'll just seem like it was an average day. So... But anyway, um, from there, I did have to go to Japanese court. We thought it was funny because they all wore slippers. That's what I took from going to Japanese court. So when I was leaving the island, I knew the guys that were um, in the um, 
rehab area, that department, and they stole um, my whole file and gave it to me as a present when I was leaving the island, so it wouldn't be carried back here. And I remember thinking, I am so lucky. And then I think, every time I have thought, I am so lucky, I nearly freaking died. And every time I thought, this is the worst thing ever, it was not only the best thing that ever happened to me. So that is another example of that. I do not know what is best for me. So, but I did come back to the States, wound up, um, and I wound up moving to Georgia, and that basically loops me all the way around. So does um, that basically is all of it. So does anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. What, what did they think about the bullet? Oh, the bullet. <laughs> yeah. So the bullet, you know, the car got impounded. When I got the car back, I waited for one of my girlfriends to be on duty. And then I had a couple of my girlfriends carry the bullet up to the barracks. And uh, we had an extra locker in our room. So we put it in the locker and when we would have parties... We'd come over and open up the lock. Everyone could see the bullet. <laughs> but then when it was time to rotate off the island, they used to make a big deal about, you know, stealing property. So um, <laughs> so we just locked the bullet in the, the locker. And I love the island. <laughs> so, all right, well, thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.